Good afternoon. Thank you, everyone. And thank you, Brianne, for coordinating and Eliana with the National Judicial Education Project for hosting this. It's a pleasure to be here with everyone today. As Brianne said, my name is Michelle Garcia. I'm the director of the Stalking Resource Center. We're a program of the National Center for Victims of Crime. We're a nonprofit organization based in Washington, D.C., and funded by the U.S. To that end, we provide training, assistance, resources, materials, and individual con consultation to professionals working either with stalking victims or offenders anywhere in the United States. In, I'd like to get a sense of who's on the webinar, and I've seen that folks have already been introducing themselves and where they're from. And so we'd like to use one of our first interactive features. We'd like to use a poll to get a sense of limited options. Um, please. complete this. All right, so it looks like we do have a mix. Uh, lots of victim service providers. Uh, attorney general's offices, coalitions, other higher education health educators, medical professionals, forensic nurses, same coordinators. Oh, excellent. It is great to see folks from so many different organizations. or professional can handle all of the issues related to these cases and it really takes collaboration amongst professionals to effectively respond. I actually want to start to make sure that we're all on the same page is with the definition of stalking that we're going to be using using to guide us. And that is that stalking is a pattern of behavior directed at a specific person that would cause a reasonable person to feel fear. Now a few things about this definition. This is not a legal definition. If you're website at the Stalking Resource Center. So if you've not seen your stalking law previously, you can definitely check it out there. This is a behavioral definition, and we're going to use this to guide us because when we do look at the laws around stalking across the country, while there are some similarities, there are differences as well. And so this will be a definition that can really unify our discussion. A few things about this definition. Pattern of behavior, or course of conduct. By nature, stalking is something that's repeated, and in fact, every It is repeated behavior. And when we look at stalking, one of the critical components is that it's behavior that would cause either the victim or a reasonable person to either experience emotional distress or fear. And that fear element is really critical because it's often what distinguishes stalking from other crimes like harassment. But while fear is really critical, it's also one of the most challenging pieces because fear is subjective. We are not all afraid of the same things. What might be terrifying to me might seem harmless or benign to you. And so when we look at stalking, one of the things we have to take into account is that context is absolutely critical. We have to look at the behavior. what those behaviors might mean to them rather than how they appear to us. 
Now, when we look at think about person showing up places where they're at, sending or leaving. behaviors in and of themselves are not criminal behaviors. That it's only when we start to see them as this pattern of behavior or this course of conduct that they might rise to this level of stalking. But it is one of the challenges in identifying stalking when we see it because those individual incidents Young adults have the highest rates of stalking. So individuals 18 to 24 year olds have the highest rates. And when we look on college campuses, we know that the rates of stalking are higher than in the general population. We also know that women are more likely to experience stalking victimization. In fact, they're nearly three times more likely to be stalked than men. Conversely, when we look at who are Overwhelmingly, our offenders tend to be male, but for our male victims, they're equally likely to be stalked by a male or a female. That stalkers will often target people around their primary target. So they may target a friend and prosecutors and judges and victim service providers who have ended up being stalked by the same person who was stalking a victim. boyfriend, ex-partner stalking the new boyfriend, the new partner. So often they'll target other people than that primary victim. And in most cases of stalking, what we know is that the victims and offenders will know each other. Rarely will they be strangers. They might be acquaintances, neighbors, friends, coworkers, classmates, relatives, we have had cases where we had a cousin stalking a cousin, an adult grandchild stalking a grandparent. But most commonly what we're going to see for both male and spouse, ex-boyfriend, ex-girlfriend, ex-partner, ex-spouse. And so I wanted to start here just by laying a little bit of a foundation about stalking and what it looks like in the U.S. And now to move into the intersection between stalking and sexual assault, one of the things we know is that the rates of sexual assault in the U.S. are extremely high, and this is probably not news to anyone on this webinar that according to research published by the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention in 2011, the National Intimate Partner and Sexual Violence Survey, which was a very large national survey looking at sexual assault, intimate partner violence, and stalking, what they found was that in one one-year period, 1.3 million women were raped. And when they look at lifetime prevalence, of sexual assault, nearly one in five women will be raped at some point in their lifetime, and one
that in a one-year period, it's estimated that 6.6 .6 million people were stalked. And what that breaks down to is about 4% of women and 1.3% of men. Over the course of their lifetime, one in six women and one in 19 men will be stalked at some point in their life. And when we start to look at the research about the intersection between stalking and sexual assault, we do find research that bears it out. That when we look at some of the national data, when stalking victims are asked, have you, have you or were you also sexually assaulted by your stalker, we see data that says it's a small number nationally, about 2%. When we look specifically at intimate partner stalking victims, it, it is a higher percentage, that it's nearly a third. The, our experience is that rarely does stalking happen in a vacuum. It will often intersect with other crimes like domestic violence or sexual violence or other types of crimes like property crimes, vandalism, arson, and also things like identity theft, threats being made, harm to other people, harm to pets, that we often see stalking intersect with other crimes. But when we look specifically at the research that has been done around this intersection between stalking and sexual assault, what is interesting about it is that overwhelmingly it has been approached from the perspective of asking stalking victims were you also sexually assaulted? And not asking sexual assault victims, were you also stalked? One notable exception to this is that the, we can look at the research done by um, Dr. David Lisak. And what's interesting is when to get our arms around this connection between. But when we think about a typical stranger assault, we know that there are often behaviors that precede a stranger sexual assault where you have the offender who might be monitoring the victim, who's watching them, following them, surveilling them, perhaps over a period of time, whether it's days or whether it's weeks. They're learning their routines. They're trying to identify vulnerabilities, or they may be gathering information about them. And so when we look at this sort of repeat behavior, either surveillance behavior or information gathering behavior, we may start to think, oh yes, this sounds like some of those behaviors we just previously talked about that are stalking behaviors. And but what about non-stranger rapists? Do they engage in the same types of behaviors? And this is where we can really turn to the work of Dr. Lisak in his examination of what he calls the undetected rapist. In part of his research on the undetected rapist, which are men who have committed acts of sexual violence who had never been prosecuted or held accountable for their assaults, he did research with nearly 2,000 volunteer participants, asking them a series of questions via a survey about their social and sexual behavior, never once asking them had they ever raped someone, but asking them questions about their behavior that would meet a legal definition of sexual assault. So questions like, have you ever had sexual intercourse with an adult men, the vast majority were not perpetrators, were not offenders. It was a percent met the criteria for rape or attempted rape. But of those 120, more than half reported committing multiple rapes. So the 120 admitted to committing a total of 483 rapes, but 76 of them, who were the repeat offenders, committed 439 of the rapes. Machine. 
Michelle. I think we're ready. Great. I'd like to make particular thanks to the National Judicial Education Project for the production of that video. And Eliana has actually posted in the chat box a link where you can actually order a copy of that video. It's an extremely powerful tool, I think, for training. So if folks are interested, please see the chat box for the information about where you can actually order that. So I'd like all of us to actually talk a little bit about the you think Frank's behavior was premeditated? All right, so we see folks responding. And overwhelmingly, people are saying, yes, that this was premeditated behavior. And I see some people are still responding, but we're Anything that you think demonstrated premeditation? And just a correction on that, we actually have a poll question where you can type that in instead of in chat. The poll question is currently open on your screen. Oh, okay. Thank you, Zach. Okay. Well, I see some folks using the chat and using both, so I'll look at both. All right. Wow. This is great. People, so we're talking about the use of alcohol, the scoping out the targets ahead of time, the designated rooms, that they were grooming them, and we'll come back to this concept again, uh, the use of the juice to mask the alcohol, the waiting for them, watching them, one person says everything they did. Okay, so clearly everyone is identifying a lot of different behaviors from Frank's story that indicated premeditation. So if we can go All right, overwhelmingly people are responding, yes, they would consider what Frank described as a rape or sexual assault. So then my next question for you is, do you think that any of Frank's behaviors could be considered stalking? Some who are saying they're not sure. And I think this is great because I will tell you that when I first started working on the issue of stalking, I've been working in the violence against women field for over 20 years, focusing predominantly on sexual assault and domestic violence. And for the past eight years now, I've been working on the issue of stalking. And when I first started thinking about these intersections between stalking and domestic violence, it was intuitive. It made absolute sense for me. And thinking about these connections between stalking and sexual And we're going to come back to this question again. So just put that on hold. So what I'd like to ask now is, for any of you who have previously worked with sexual assault victims, please use the raise your hand feature, which should be at the top of your screen, if you've ever worked with a sexual assault victim who was contacted by the offender after the assault. Okay. All right. So it's quite a few of you. In fact, more than half of you have said you have worked with a sexual assault victim who was contacted by the offender after the assault. I will tell you that that has been my experience as well, that I have worked with uh, 
I'm not even sure how many sexual assault victims at this point, and an overwhelming number of them were con that one is threat that the offender contacts the victim to threaten them either implicitly or explicitly, either to threaten them to be silent, to not tell anyone, to not report, or if they have told someone or have reported to law enforcement, to recant. So threats. Another type of contact that I've frequently seen is that the offender will contact the victim, one, to try and ascertain how the victim is actually thinking about the incident and what happened, and then also to try and actually frame that incident for them, to actually influence how they are thinking about it, particularly if there are alcohol or drugs. and said things like, wow, you were so drunk at that party last night, you kept coming on to me, you were all over me, you couldn't keep your hands off of me, trying to get the victim to think that they were the one who initiated the activity or that they were the ones who were a consensual and willing participant in this, so trying to frame that incident for them. And then in some cases, the offender contacts the victim because they don't think they did anything wrong, and in fact, they're interested in maintaining social contact and possibly hooking up again. And so we see all this different type of contact that can happen after an assault, and it can be in a variety of different formats. So when we think about contact, that might be actually seeing that person again, so in a scenario like texting, using email, or social media. And when we look at social media, it's both contact in terms of initiating contact with the victim, so maybe commenting or posting on a victim's social media site, or commenting or posting about the victim on their own site or on somebody else's site. One example of this was in a been sexually assaulted by one of her fellow students. In the aftermath of the assault, the victim was told by one of her friends that she needed to search for photos of herself on Facebook. Facebook, you can tag that photo with your name. So that if you or any of your friends searches for images using your name, any photo that is tagged with your name will show up. In this case, the offender had taken this photo and posted it to his own Facebook page. So this photo was posted on his page. In the photo, you can see he has a knife in one hand, a handgun. photo with the victim's name. So when she searched for photos of herself, this picture came up. Now, raise your hand if you would consider this a threat. And Zach, for some reason I can't see the responses. Can you let me know how people are responding? Sure, currently we have 144 people with their hands raised. Okay, great. So we've got a little more than half of folks who are saying yes, they would consider this a threat. So let's go back to our original definition of stalking. Now let's look at a situation like the one we've been talking about where we have this initial approach and engagement where 
The perpetrator may be continuously contacting that person through a variety of different medias that they're showing up at their class or their residence, their workplace. They're gathering information about them. They're, in essence, grooming them. Several people had mentioned that earlier. Now, at this point, the likelihood is the victim is not afraid of them that in fact they may be feeling flattered, that here's this upperclassman or this person who's inviting me to this exclusive event or exclusive party, and they show up at the party. So the likelihood is they're not afraid. But let's continue looking at this course of conduct. Then we have the sexual assault happen. after the assault? Would that distress or would that fear continue in that victim? And so when we look at this as a full course of conduct, is this a course of conduct that would make a reasonable person feel fear? And our argument is yes. And one of the critical things to recognize that when it comes to stalking is that fear does not have to attach to every single incident. And in fact, The offender has perhaps placed a GPS tracker on the victim's car. The victim is unaware of it, is driving around over the course of a few days or weeks or happening, again, that fear kicks in. And it can be considered retroactive to the times when those were happening because we have to look at the full course of conduct. And so let me ask you, in looking at this, in thinking about this concept of stalking and how it might intersect with sexual assault, what do you think? And it looks again like overwhelmingly we have those who are responding saying yes. We still have a few people saying no. And we can talk a little bit more about some of those considerations about why it might not be stalking. And, and I will recognize that there may be a distinction between what we can look at behaviorally, and perhaps what our, our law in our specific jurisdiction considers stalking. So overwhelmingly folks said, yes, there is this connection between stalking and sexual assault. But in thinking about that, there's any benefit to making this connection between stalking and sexual assault. All right, so let's see, we have folks saying better care for survivors, prevention, prosecution, education, could add stalking charges if the sexual assault charges don't stick more resources, intervention, great. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you all so much for your answers. These are absolutely the types of three themes that we can identify in terms of benefits. Validating a victim's experience, enhancing opportunities for intervention, and then increasing opportunities for offender accountability through our criminal justice, or say if it's a college or university, maybe the judicial system.
is that one of the things it can do is put the blame solidly on that perpetrator and perhaps reduce the incidence of victim blaming. I will tell you that my experience in working with sexual assault survivors is that almost every single one of them in the aftermath of the assault blame themselves for the assault, even if it was only for just a fraction of a second. They blame themselves for the assault, and, and we understand what that's about. It's about trying to regain that sense of control that the offender has taken away from them. So as a victim, if you can say, well, it's because I went to that party or because I drank that punch or because I went to that room, I'm never going to go to a party again. I'm never going to drink punch again. I'm never going to go to a person's room. It can help demonstrate that it wasn't about an individual choice or choices that were made, that this person had the misfortune of encountering a predator who had set them up from the get-go. And then it in non-stranger sexual assaults, there's this feeling like they have to have some additional type of proof or documentation if they're going to report to law enforcement in order for something to happen. Versus she said, where the focus is on what happened in just that moment in that room, rather than looking at all of the behaviors that came beforehand and any of the behaviors that followed the sexual assault. And so when we bring in all with some enhanced opportunities for intervention, both with the victim and with the offender or on colleges and universities, in high schools and middle schools, around the issues of sexual violence. And recognizing that so often these types of behaviors are being witnessed both by the victim or people around the victim or people around the offender, and that if we see these behaviors and intervene in them early, that we can prevent more serious crimes, more serious types of violence from happening. I think stalking is absolutely ripe for this type of intervention effort as well, because we know that when we look at stalking behaviors, so often other people are witnessing them. Either it's people around the victim who are seeing them get the repeated phone calls or text messages or are aware of someone really offers us this great opportunity for prevention when we're looking at sexual assault and we've got research to prove that, and I think it's ripe for stalking as well. And then increased offender accountability, that by making this connection between stalking and sexual assault, there's a number of different things that we can do. other types of evidence that normally they would be prohibited from including. So looking at 404B evidence. So because stalking is a course of conduct crime, in order to prove it, you have to show all of the behavior, the behavior in the context, you have to show the full course of conduct. And so it might allow a prosecutor to actually bring in some of that evidence around a sexual assault that they might otherwise not be able to use. There's prosecutors that we work with it's there. And in fact, California has one of the most challenging stalking laws. So if the rate is that high in California, I imagine it can be much higher in other places. And that it really assists her in prosecuting her sexual assault cases. 
is viewed within the correct context of the law, again, our statutes can criminalize those seemingly benign behaviors. So all of those they might still be considered criminal if we start thinking about them as stalking rather than just coming before or after the assault and not specific to that incident itself. And then finally, we know that so often these cases may get pled out or that they are difficult cases sometimes for judges or juries. And so if we have multiple count complaints that not all of the elements of sexual assault have been stalking and sexual assault that can both serve victims, perhaps prevent victimizations, and also ultimately try and hold offenders accountable in these cases. I want to mention that we have lots of different resources available um, for professionals on our website, and that's our web address. And though we don't work directly with victims of stalking, we do have numerous resources for victims on our website that either victims can access or if you're working with victims, feel free to access and pass those on to any victims that you might be working with. So I'm actually um, going to turn it back over to uh, either Brianna or Eliana, who I think is going to facilitate any questions. I can facilitate questions. Um, so if people want to just write in um, questions to the Q&A area or the chat box, then I can um, direct them to Michelle to answer. There are currently three questions in the Q&A. All right. Um, so here is one, um, Michelle, from your victim. Yeah, we definitely see that challenge across the country in, in terms of the technology and, and the concerns about, you know, how do you prove that this is authentic? How do you prove its origins? And, and of DNA. When DNA first became a tool that was being used in prosecutions, most judges didn't understand it, most judges didn't know it, but then they received training on it and about how to evaluate it and whether it was admissible. And I think it's the same thing with our technology. It's understanding what our technology, what it is, how offenders are using it, and, and how you can view it as reliable evidence. And it is one of the challenges we're seeing. So in fact, one of the projects we're going to be working on end of this year, hopefully beginning of next year, is creating a resource specific about technology. And what do you let in? What don't you let in? How do you evaluate it? Because having just this blanket, nothing from the internet, is doing a disservice, both to victims and to defendants, who in cases who where you have a defendant who may actually be innocent, if there's some sort of evidence online that can prove that, it does a disservice to them as well if that is not admissible evidence. And so it is a challenge. At this point, it's trying to do that perhaps one-on-one -on -one education with your judges um, and working with your prosecutors to try and get that information into evidence.
States. Um, so there, there's no definition that's really simple, but what I, I do suggest are two things. Um, one is if you go to our website, so victimsofcrime.org slash SRC, we have an entire page dedicated to stalking laws. So we have the stalking laws of all the states up there, the federal statute, tribal codes, um, the UCMJ stalking uh, article. We also have on our website a model code. So this is something that we produced as a guide for states who are looking to perhaps enhance their existing stalking laws and that we really created as a roadmap for what we think an effective stalking law looks like. So one of the things I can suggest is, you know, go and look at some of the different states and how they, how they have written their laws around stalking. Look at the model stalking code and see how you The laws are one piece of our response. And I can look at states that have, at least on paper, what look like to be statutes where it would be really challenging to in those states where they're having success. Conversely, is to be charged, but, but yet because of perhaps lack of training for law enforcement or for prosecutors, we don't see a lot of investigations or a lot of prosecutions happening. And so our, our laws are absolutely a starting point, but they have to go hand in hand with comprehensive training for criminal justice personnel throughout our jurisdictions. Great, and we have, here are um, two questions I think you could answer together. Um, what process do you recommend for courage to report, police might not help at first, or they may require more information, and then someone else asks, in terms of proving stalking retroactively, what types of evidence could be used? Maybe you can um, address those together. Yeah, um, sure. So one of the things we recommend is, is that stalking victims document what's happening to them. And, and they can do this in a variety of different ways. So for example, we on our website have a stalking incident log that victims can use. Is, um, was law enforcement contacted? If so, who was the responding officer? What was a report made? So it can be something like that. It can also be something like a calendar or a date book. So on any given day that something happens, the victim's writing on their calendar or in their date book what happened, what time it happened. Or it can be a journal, or it can be an app. So there are a number of different apps out there. There's one that recently came out called Stop a Stalker. Um, it's an app. Right now I believe it's available for iPhone. I'm not sure about Android that a stalking victim can use to, on their phone, catalog different behaviors that are happening. And all of this can be extremely helpful if a victim does choose to report to law enforcement or to get an order of protection. And respond to an incident. It is the nature of policing that they receive a report for a burglary or for vandalism or for damage to property and they're responding to that incident. Not about the things that came, you know, a day before, a week before, six months before. And that's the challenge with stalking is that it is a course of conduct crime. So to be able to see it one has to see that course of conduct. And while we're working to train law enforcement around the country to change how they approach these cases, what can be extremely helpful, and we've seen this in so many cases, is when a victim does report to law enforcement, and maybe it's because they came home and found their tires slashed, or they received that threatening text message, that 
in a, while the officer may be focusing on that incident, they can pull out the stalking incident log, or they can pull out their calendar, or pull the app up and say, but look, here is everything else that came before. And it's a real to, to save. So save the emails, save the text messages, save the letters and gifts. And, and this can be a really challenging thing to do because I think if most of us think about it, if we get an email or a text message or a voicemail that upsets us or that bothers us, our first instinct is to just hit delete, right? It's a very natural instinct. And so we want to be talking with victims about preserving that. And it could be in ways where they're not having to interact with it all the time. So if it's emails, for instance, setting up a filter in their email so that any messages from the offender go into a folder and they never have to look at them. But saving all of those things are really critical. In terms of going back, need to or are considering reporting, that it depends on the type of incidents or behaviors that have been happening. So, you know, even if you've deleted an email, it may not be absolutely gone. There may be a way to retrieve it. If you've deleted a text message, it may not be completely gone. So, Particularly when we're looking at some of these pieces around technology, there may be a way to retrieve things that we think have been lost. Another value might be in talking to friends, neighbors, relatives, people who might have driving by the victim's house or who saw the offender leave something on the victim's steps, even if the victim didn't keep whatever it was that they left, there's still something that might be able to show or demonstrate what the victim is describing. And so looking at either the technology and is it retrievable or are there other people who can substantiate the incidents that the victim's reporting. Um, let's see, are there any other questions? Because we only have about five more minutes, so maybe if we have one more quick question. Um, I'm just looking in the chat box, but if we missed it, if you want to just send one more question right back in. I think one of the, there was um, a question about apps that let people um, follow each other. And I know there are some very good anti-stalking apps, but I know there are also apps that exist where you can allow someone to monitor you on your phone. Do you, um, I don't know if you've had experience dealing with um, any of that sort of GPS monitoring on smartphones? Yeah. a friend on iPhones or, or a lot of different apps where you can essentially install an app and you can set it so that other people can track you. But we also see this in stalking cases where if the offender has access to the victim's phone, they might install the app on the phone and use it to track the victim and the victim may not realize that it's actually on their phone. So, and there's some that are actually designed to run sort of in a stealth mode, so you wouldn't know. So there's things like that. There's spyware, which can actually be installed on somebody's cell phone, which would give an offender almost complete access to the phone. Not only could they track it, they could see text messages, call history. They can conference themselves into conversations that are happening so they can hear incoming Uh, for anyone who's actually interested 